me both online and in person. I'm gonna wait. Everyone, I'm gonna wait for a yes online here. I'm watching the chat. Video and sound working well. Thank you, Sandra. All right. So um, I'm excited to introduce Nancy Cost from the Buffalo Seed Company. But Kevin wanted me to let everybody know. If you're here online with us, thank you so much for joining us. It allows us to, you know, bring up so many more people. But you are missing out on free plants. What were what were they again, Kevin? White trumpet lilies. White trumpet lilies are being given away for free in person here. Plus, there's always snacks and drinks and things like that. But we appreciate everybody joining, whether it is in person or online. Um, so Nancy Cost is from the Altiplano of Bolivia and grew up growing quinoa, potato and llamas in a resilient and sustainable system that predates the Inca empire. She has extensive farming experience throughout the Americas and deep knowledge and wisdom of seeds, seed systems, culture of food, diversity in agriculture, food system and adaptation. In 2018, Matthew and Nancy, along with their two kids, launched the Buffalo Seed Company. She holds a bachelor's degree in agronomy from Earth University in Costa Rica and a master of science degree in tomato breeding from Ohio State University. It is my pleasure to introduce to you, Nancy. Good evening, everybody. I'm happy, it's all quite a people. I wasn't expecting that many people. <laughs> so that's great to know that there is a lot of people interested in seeds and how we can keep preserving diversity and especially in time like this and it seems like there's quite a people too online so that's great so here is with me Silveria she's a little bit shy but <laughs> okay uh so uh I want to start like uh kind of like with the how many first I want to ask a question how many of you have saved seeds all of you why are you in this class again <laughs> just kidding uh well like so that's great that's a lot of people already in this journey which is very positive thing and i want to start with like what is the importance of saving seeds uh i look at seeds and we look at seeds at the buffalo seed company as like children and also we look like at this site this this closing cycle like just like humans, right? We have one generation and we acquire all this experience that we live through our life. And then we pass whatever we acquire to our kids and then our grandkids, especially like when the, when the grandparents and the grandkids join together, the cycle, the wisdom that's passed, it's, I don't think it's possible to pass from parents because parents were so busy to put them online. But like I grew up with grandparents, like we grew up in this um, multi multi generation family, and the things I acquired from grandparents, it's not the same what I acquired from my from my parents. You know, my parents like don't do this, don't do this all the time. But parents like without the like once you get I guess to that age. You just know how to teach. And that's how we look at the seeds too. Because at the end, like all the seeds are the expression of the past environments. Like whatever the seeds had experienced on their past lives, I'm gonna bring it to them to pass it to the next generation. So um, that's how it has every culture around the world have done. I grew up doing like that. There wasn't a separation when I was growing up in Bolivia. There's the seed industry, the food industry. There wasn't such a thing. It was like, uh, I remember harvesting potatoes. We get like tons of tons of potatoes. And then grandma would say like, okay, you find this beautiful, this size. And we put it here, those ones are for seeds for next year. And the same thing with quinoa. We go on the field first, grandma will go like, okay, I like that one, that one. Okay, we're going to save. She's just going to walk before we harvest all of them. She's just gonna walk through there. So that's how I kind of like get into like, I, I didn't never saw like there is this industry, this other industry. When I moved to the United States, in my mind was everywhere in the world like that, you know, like if it was in Bolivia, like that has to be here too. Then I find out that was not the truth, you know? And then like uh, years back, we saw this chart 
where it, like the consolidation, how it was happening. Big companies buying small companies. And then a lot of people started buying, you know, like everybody's trying to like, okay, you gotta buy from these small companies. And then when you trace back, the seed is coming from the same place. So you're not really bringing any diversity, you know, because at one point I was like, okay, I'm gonna buy some seeds from Washington. And then I'm gonna buy some seeds from New York, some things from the South. And I'm gonna be able to combine, there should be some diversity, right? One would think that way. And I called the companies, small companies, and I called them like, okay, so how did you grow them? Because I, we were going in terms of like, started using so much inputs, too much fertilizer or too much irrigation. So you can start adapting your seeds to, to how you do it because everybody has their own ways to do it, you know, because you, some, some people love to irrigate. It's kind of fun in the morning you get up and you put some water, but some people don't want to do that. Some people want to like use other techniques to do it. So I wanted to figure it out like, okay, where the seeds are coming from? And one thing it was like, nobody could tell me where the seeds were coming from. The, all they told me is like, Oh, we bought from these companies, so we really don't know where they were grown. That was kind of like a shocking for me. Like, and and then you trace back a lot of those companies uh, buy seeds, like tons of seeds that are grown out of out of the country. And then what does that mean for our food security? What happens if, like back then, nobody was thinking about COVID, right? But, but then it was, I was thinking 2017, what if something happens or those countries decided to no longer grow seeds for us or somebody decided not to send our seeds our way, what are we going to do? And, and in 2019 and 20, what happened with peppers and tomatoes in Europe, there was not coming a lot of peppers and tomatoes from Europe because there was a virus and those specific varieties. So they were not allowed the USDA, which is a good reason, right? Because if those virus or any disease that comes in the country will destroy a lot of our crops. So that's like the, the basic of like trying to diversify, not just the type of crops we're growing, but then also the places where we are growing. Because if they fail, we can have enough seeds here to send them back. And then the other thing is when they start doing like there's the seed industry, the food industry, the food industry, it's demanding for tomatoes, for example, that they can stay longer on the shelf for a good reason, right? If you go to the farmers, to the grocery, you don't want to look at rotten tomato there, do you? <laughs> so there is a reason why there is like the long shelf tomatoes because they have to come in our case, like they come from Mexico or uh, California. And everywhere in the world that was, the, you know, there's a specific places, like for example, in Europe, a lot of the tomatoes are grown in Spain. So they have to have a tomato that can travel all the way from Spain, all the way to everywhere in Europe. So there, I mean, like there is a different objective there. It is an industry that is running. And then that, that has, a lot of loss and diversity. There is a chart also like in 1950s, how many tomato lines across the world was grown? The sweet, sweet corn, all the, all the vegetables and how that shrink by 1980. There was like a few, I mean, like the, the diversity that we lost, it's, it's dramatic. And then like uh, um, what happens with that loss is in a, in a like in a time that is, the weather is changing, the climate is changing. Like this year has been too rough, isn't it? Like how many of you have, did anybody have tomatoes? <laughs> that was a bad question. <laughs> yeah, tomatoes has been rough this year because of the high temperatures. And then like a lot of, <clears throat> a lot of people would think like heirlooms are good. They're good in flavor, but then also we gotta think like they are like in the past. And then we are a culture of evolving, right? Because like what our great grandparents <clears throat> used to do, it was a little bit different. And back then it was different to what it was around in our area, right? So I think like um, it's very important to think in terms of land races. When land races are basically a diverse population that 
you can select out of like your liking. Like if you have like a diverse population of corn, for example, that has different colors, sweet corn, and you can go like, okay, I like the red one, or the red grows, or the red grows better for me, or the yellow ones, and the environment itself will, will shape it. It's not like a, you have to do anything. You put it on the, on the field, and then you let the environment to shape what grows on yourself. But if you don't put diversity, the environment, there's, there's gonna be nothing to work on. And if some type of, um, of a disease comes or like, um, like this weather came, like very high temperatures, like we've been growing tomatoes without irrigation for four or five years here in Kansas. And we brought this year new varieties to test them, you know, like, because we wanna keep bringing more diversity. And it was very interesting to know, like a, a couple, the majority that we brought new, they couldn't handle the uh, heat wave. But we have a couple of varieties that they've been growing here in Kansas like year after year and we've been saving seeds from them. They didn't care if it was like 95 or 100. So that's, that's the, the nice thing on like on diversity. And the same thing like with squashes, like what's the main issue is like squash bark. If we can find a variety that could thrive on your soil and it can go like, um, the, the, the nice thing with plants is like, they, they know, they learn. So sometimes we just like move them like a, um, in one area, they're gonna do great. But if you move it from there, they're not gonna do it great the next year. So I think it's like, if you, everybody can save their own seeds or at least like at the regional level. Because like in Kansas, like 93% of our vegetables comes from outside of the country, outside of our state where we can grow a lot of vegetables here and we can figure out how to preserve them. A lot of people probably know how to do canning, all that for winter time. So we can like avoid bringing a lot of food outside. So that is main, the main, I think like a goal, how to create uh, a resiliency in our area. And I, I understand everybody like, um, um, like hybrids, you know, and I, I mean, like, it's nothing really wrong with hybrids either, you know, it's just like the, when the thing gets so centralized, it's hard to change it because like once the COVID hit, a lot of people couldn't get their seats because they had to move, like, for example, one company has to move from India all the way to, to California from California had to figure it out. Like I think the headquarters were somewhere in the Northeast. So they had to move all the way there until that time happened and all the all people not working in the USPS losing the packages. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's a chaos, but if we have regional seed business, like you can even drive an hour to go pick up your seeds, right? or if better off if you can save your own seeds. Now we go to the saving seeds. Uh, like it takes a little planning to do save, saving seeds because like first off you have to think, uh, what, what do you like the best? And then do you have enough space to grow them? Because with saving seeds, you kind of have to have enough uh, plants especially with outcrossers. We're talking about the corn, squash, cucumbers, melons. Because if you don't have it, if you just harvest from one plant or you just have one plant, maybe grow good next year, but there is the diversity is not captured on that one single plant. So you kind of have to have like a big population, what's called now with selfers like tomatoes, peppers, beans, um, black eyed peas, those ones, you don't need that big population. You should be good with 12, 12 plants. And now like, and also it takes like, then, then you have another crop like the biennials. Anybody knows what's a biennial? Biennial, like you need two years to produce seed, right? So for that, you have to plan in terms of having like big population to start with because 
First, I mean, like we have a lot of creatures to share with. So <laughs> everybody knows. <laughs> so like, for example, with broccoli, you should start at least with 50 plants because you're gonna lose some, you're gonna eat some. And then when you are doing the vernalization, which means like you either leave it outside to let the cold um, happen on the plant or put it in the refrigerator. And then you take it in the springtime, plant, replant it, or dig it out if you put some straw or something on the plant and let it grow again. And then at that time, it's gonna start growing and it's gonna flower. And same thing with beets. But during all the process, you will lose. That's just a given. So you kind of have to start planning in terms of that. And then we go to the next, uh, the other side is you have to think in terms of um, what kind of like, if, if the plant has a true flower, tomato, peppers, eggplants have a true flower, they, they can do themselves, they can self pollinate. But then we have the corn, it's more, more niches, right? Which has a male flower and a female flower in the same plant, but they're in different parts of the plant. The same thing with all the cucurbits. We have like first the male flowers and cucumbers. Like you see like a lot of flowers and a lot of people say, my cucumber is not having any, any fruits yet, but because the female, flowers hasn't come yet. And then we have the dioecious, like spinach. With that, you have to have at least 50 plants because some plants are gonna produce just male flowers. And some plants are gonna produce just female flowers. And then they need the wind to do the pollination. So kind of like a, there's a lot of planning to do in terms of like, a, what are you gonna save seeds? I mean, like a spinach, like before, I feel like I could eat the spinach before they can even start flowering. <laughs> but at that point, you're not gonna know which plant is female, which plant is male. They all look the same. At one point when the heat comes in and it starts spreading, and then you start seeing like the male flowers have this little kind of yellowish and when you touch it, it's gonna be sprouting pollen everywhere. So like, yeah, but, but it's a wonderful crop, spinach. Who doesn't love spinach? It's kind of like hard to grow in Kansas because like with a short window we have. And then we go like with broccoli or kale that they, they have the perfect flower, female and male part is in the same flower, but they don't like to self pollinate. So they're kind of like a forced out process. They need bees. Now, when you are doing like a seed production, you can just have broccoli and kale in the same place because they can, they can cross pollinate each other or the bees can do that. So you cannot think of that. And then when you are doing the isolation, you have to put bees inside of it. Now, like with tomatoes, like peppers, the bees can visit too. Like sometimes people think like they can, the, the peppers cannot cross pollinate, but they will. So in order to, but since they are a true true flowers and they can sell. You can just put um, kind of like a mosquito netting on top on each variety and cover them. And then you are great with them. Then you can have as many peppers as, as you wish to. And then what else do we have? I'm trying to cover otherwise then I'm gonna go, how much time I have left? Do you want to put your... Yeah, we'll try with that. So I, I think like that's the main like basics and now I'm gonna kind of show you a little bit of the seeds. And then if anybody has any questions, uh, we can start like, I, I divide the seeds like wet processing and then the dry processing and the herbs and flowers. So I'm gonna show you a little bit and then we talk more about it, like how you isolate or how do you separate them or ways you can, um, Make sure you have you. The, the the point is like you're trying to when you are saving seeds, you're trying to save seeds what you want, not what the bees want out of your plants, right? <laughs> <laughs> so that's the point. Okay, I'm gonna try to keep. Ah, oh, okay, 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 okay. Let's just start. Give me the. We're gonna start with tomatoes. So everybody knows about tomatoes, right? Is it right? <laughs> Nobody wants to talk about tomatoes. Everybody's upset about tomatoes. I see that. 
<laughs> well, I have the medicine though. <laughs> so we have here one of the main thing is when you're saving seeds is label. Don't try to play on your I'm gonna be on it. it never works <laughs> because because so label when you are like I like to use clear container where I can see it. So this is white cherry. This is one of the new varieties we tried this year. Actually, it is great. So we're very happy with this variety. And what you do is basically like everybody knows that, right? Uh, okay, I gotta make sure I show. So the seeds are on the inside. Everybody can see it, right? <laughs> right there? Okay, that's good. So, um, so the, the, the tomatoes have this gelatin that covers the seeds. So what we do is you can use another agent like acid to do it faster, but how naturally it's done is done on fermentation. You cut these and then you put the pulp inside of a container and then in two or three days, now they're gonna start separating. The seeds are gonna start going down and then up here in the top, it's gonna have this little white mold. That's when, and then when you smell it, it smells like a yeast. So uh, I, I like the smell of yeast, you know? <laughs> so uh, some people think like it's yucky, but, but what, what do we try to do is like try to put like as many as good tomatoes. You don't want to put like rotten tomatoes there because sometimes there could be some type of um, disease in there. And sometimes they're like a seed borne disease that those diseases can go on the seeds. And then you can plant next year and then your tomato just dies because it had some fungus, something on the seeds. So it's very important, like when you are choosing, you choose like with tomatoes, like with these ones, like you don't need that many seeds, right? So out of like, for example, this one doesn't have as many seeds as I wish, but they have enough seeds. So then you wait like uh, probably in this hot weather, probably two, three days, you're gonna start seeing that white. This one has been processed yesterday. He's the one who did the work. <laughs> <laughs> and then once you have that, what happens is like in the process of fermentation, the gelatin gets uncovered. And then you dump up, uh, on this strainer and then just put it in a faucet and rinse it off. And you have clean seeds. Now, like you put it back here and then put it in water, it's gonna float every, any chaff that is or any skin that you didn't took it off, it will float on the top. You can dump that one out and then you dry it, your seeds in paper towel for three, four, depends. Like if you have like space where the, the air is flowing nicely, five days, it's perfect. And then you can store them, I'm trying to, you can store them like coin envelopes, uh, any containers and I'm trying to see if I have something to see. Or uh -oh, glass. glass containers are the best ones to store because they <coughs> buffer the change of the temperature. So the main thing with seed is in order for them to keep for a longer period. Tomatoes, for example, they can stay good for 12, 10 years. So like one year you save a lot of seeds and just, again, label, put the name, put the seed where it's grown or the year. So you know how old it is because you're not gonna remember next year how many seeds you do this year. Rinse the original stuff. So that is with that variety of tomato, put it back right there. And then anybody can eat it. This is delicious. <laughs> and this is our, one of our varieties that we've been growing here for. We brought this from Ohio. It's called the Grapescape. And the nice thing with this thing is this one doesn't have seeds. Like, I, I mean, like, I mean, in these ones, I don't know how many fruits I have. This one has zero seeds. But it is delicious. <laughs> <laughs> hmm? Another fruit with no seeds. So I have to go like for at least a hundred pounds of cutting them and like finding no seeds again. I will see if I can find a, a tomato that has seeds, this one. Oh no, I'm not liking this. <laughs> <laughs> but it produces, it just has 
tons of tons of fruits. Okay, I think like we're in bad luck. I thought I got enough to get at least one seed. They're tiny seeds. Mm -mm. No. Uh oh. Huh? Nothing either. Okay, I'm running out of tomatoes at this point. <laughs> And I am not finding not a single seed. Yep, this one is, it's always been like that. Um, it is possible. Um, one of my favorites when I was growing in, the, when I was working in the lab, it was one of my most favorite tomatoes, this one. Would you say that variety again? The grape scape, Oops. because we get it out of the academy. Yeah, he did the grape scape with me. <laughs> well, no seeds in audio. Oh, there is tiny bit. Yep, there are tiny bit on this one. I'll show you. Can you see it? Nothing. I see it. Right, tiny seeds. Yeah, these ones have really kind of tiny seeds. Some of them are big. But it produces grapes, so when we pack them, of course, like you can expect not that many seeds, right? <laughs> but the germination is good because we try to do like very um, uh, fresh seeds. As you can see, like probably we grew this year probably 40 plants and we got like probably right now 100 pounds of tomatoes and these tomatoes, but who knows how many seeds I'm going to get out of it. <laughs> So that is with tomato. Anybody has any questions with tomatoes? When you're talking about the summer thing, because I ended up having to learn to do it on the fly, and there were several suggestions during your fermented process in the bowl to separate everything out, the, the slurry and the seed, is to give it a shake a couple of times through the day to help break all that stuff loose. Yeah, what I do is like this, move. <laughs> Just whenever I'm passing, and if I if we have like a big yeah, the shaking yeah, that's a good point. Yep, yep. Does it matter what the time of the season? Like for tomatoes, uh, they produce over a long period. Mm -hmm. uh, do you take fruit from uh, uh, early in the season or late in the season? Does it matter? No, really. Like just find whatever you want your, like whenever you feel like and whenever you have your time to do it. Sometimes like if you forgot and then late on the season after the frost even so sometimes you can save your seeds. If if you online if you could repeat or paraphrase a question and oh, then answer that would be great. Okay. All righty. Thank you. Oh okay. Yeah. Well the first question was uh the importance of shaking or stirring the, the tomato pulp. It is very important. And then the second question was if it matters when you when you harvest your tomatoes for saving seeds really doesn't matter you can do the first thing in the season later in the season or after the frost yeah whenever you have time if you're doing now for us we try to have the beginning to the end and we keep processing all the two months of growing tomatoes so anybody else any questions there is a question online. Okay. Um, what is the isolation distance of the tomato? That's a good question. I, yeah, you see, that's why it's nice to question. Um, tomato seeds are very selfing, that they can sell themselves. So I think like this 10 feet is recommended. Uh, so you can have a lot of tomatoes, but even then, like if you don't have many pollinators, they're not gonna jump or there's not wind. The wind is not gonna take the pollen. So 10 feet to 25 feet, that is kind of like 10 feet is the minimum for seed for for um keeping like the seed 100 percent pure like you know like for, especially for seed production but now if you want to be adventurous <laughs> <laughs> that's up to you <laughs> yeah uh, seed savers in iowa um if you go to their online uh, mm -hmm. resources it has a complete list of uh, distances and uh, population even, size uh, population to get a Broad genetic diversity. That is, yeah, that's yeah. a good resource. Uh, seed savers, it's, uh, well, it's a seed archive. Uh, yeah. In Iowa. Seed, savers. seed saver exchange. And then also they have a book, it's called The Seed Garden. 
It's a really good book that you can go. We, we use that book and then the other book is called Seed to Seed. I can't remember the author of that book, but it's also good. Yeah, <coughs> like that, like just to have a reference, you know. Anybody else question on tomatoes? We can go on the peppers. Okay, peppers are great. She, she, pepper is her favorite. Is there any other pepper there? So with peppers, like, like I said, with tomatoes, it's very similar, but unlike them, uh, uh, with tomatoes, you know when the seeds are ready is when the tomatoes are ready to eat. Now, with the, from the green tomatoes, like if you forget to save your seeds and you have green tomatoes at the end of the season, you can put it in, in a paper bag and let it turn red. The seeds are going to be viable, but they're going to take a little bit longer to germinate. Like, for example, some of the tomatoes, like if they're from red, it would take probably five, five to six days. But if you have like from green tomatoes that you harvest and then you let it go to, it would take a little bit of time. But you will have seeds. Now with peppers, like normally, for example, this is uh, called early jalapeno. Uh, this is what we know about jalapeno, right? Like when we, when we think of jalapeno, we think of this green one. But this one doesn't have a mature seed. So the seeds are not mature here. You have to wait until they turn red, which takes at least another extra two weeks or more sometimes. It depends like what weather we're having. So at this point, this uh, pepper has mature seeds. I'm not cutting this because it's <laughs> <laughs> If anybody wants to cut it, more than welcome with that. So that's like with almost all the peppers. And now like with the chilies, like um, Thai peppers, those ones that I think would be safer for you. Uh, Matthew is the one who does all the peppers. <laughs> Hot and everything. So if you see on our website, the peppers, just think of him <laughs> cutting off. And he makes a wonderful like um, hot sauces, delicious with all the flesh that's left. And that's a nice thing with pepper. And with like, now we go to the bell pepper. This is called chocolate cake. And this is the color that needs to turn. When it's early, it's actually green. It just like looks like a green. All of these ones look like green bell peppers. When they are, when they are green, the seeds are not mature. So on peppers, you have to let it go to like either this color red, this one is, I think this is paprika, paprika. And this one is Wisconsin lakes, uh, somebody sees that. And then sometimes you have like that issue of like creatures getting inside it and they will go directly to the seeds. That's just, and with this one, for example, we're gonna cut it, you wanna eat it? Mm -hmm. So there are the seeds, you see? Somebody went to inside there too. I'm trying, yeah, there is, I, I found it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not kidding, look. That is an, it's just like, so creatures that you can, <laughs> you have to share with. I mean, that's the reality of life, yeah. Do you need to let peppers mature to seed on the vine? On the plane, okay. yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's why I'm saying it's like you can, whenever our peppers are coming nice, like we have like some one pepper plant, like tons of tons of pepper. And, and then I'm always nervous because, mm -hmm. because the, cre the, the little <laughs> creatures will be going inside there and then eating. Maybe you uh, address this, but can you, is there any way to look at the pepper and how it's matured without cutting it? Uh, when it's a color. Like, well, okay. oh, like a green pepper. Green pepper. I mean, all the green peppers at the end are immature peppers. They will turn all the green peppers that like, like what, well, for they example, will turn. they will turn like shishito, oh. for example, all the green peppers, mm -hmm. green bells that we buy in the store or the farmer's market, all of them gonna turn into red. Red, orange, or beautiful brown like this one like th this one is like wh when when this one is in mature it looks just like a normal bell green pepper so all the peppers turn color every pepper like either orange or like brown like this or like for example there is like a black Hungarian 
everybody knows like as a black Hungarian pepper because most of when it started when it started having this little pepper, it's black. But then if you leave it there for another two weeks or three weeks, it's gonna turn red. So all the peppers turn color. So that's like, oh, we'll see if we, if we find an oh with with the like I will see if I find a good one here. Now this one is good one. That's a perfect one. It's moving with me. Yeah. <laughs> I was trying to move with the thing. You did some secret signal to make it zoom in. <laughs> you see, I mean, magic. <laughs> so this is a perfect one. They can't be any more perfect than this. So like in one pepper, you have tons of seeds. So what you do, like you have two options on peppers. Like you can just put it in a in a strainer like this and then empty it out, take it out, all the seeds there, and rinse it off. Or you can also like cut it off the whole thing along with this and do the fermentation just like a tomato. And what does that happen? Like just imitating nature, you know, like normally any pepper, if it's left by themselves, they're gonna fall down and So uh, sometimes the germination is better if you do the fermentation, because like even though like in tomatoes we can see clearly the the little mucilage that's covering the seeds, right? But in peppers we don't see it, but there must be something there that kind of like the, that if you don't rinse them or if you don't do the fermentation won't germinate as fast. So that that. It's another, another extra step. So that's what you do with, with peppers. The same thing with watermelons, um, melons, uh, cucumbers, kind of like similar to the peppers. <coughs> you cut it, you take it out, all the thing, the, the, the juice, the seed, and put it in a container and let her. With the zucchini, I want to talk about like a lot of people grow zucchinis or cucumbers. With those ones, unlike like peppers, for example, on this one, we're gonna be able to eat the skin, right? Or the, the pepper, but with the um, cucumbers and zucchinis, you have to let it go until you can no longer eat it. It has to turn yellow, like way yellow on the plant at the point in the, in the zucchinis and cucumbers, like where when you pull it out of the vine, it would just get it off easily. So that's when you know the seeds are ready. So there's like a big difference in terms of like when you eat it and when they're ready. For watermelons and, and melons, it's the best thing to do for seeds. It's like when you harvest from the garden, you just want to eat the watermelon, that melon, right? <laughs> but you kind of have to wait if you want to save seeds. Because like when the, when the water, when you harvest and you put it and then what the, the fruit does, or maybe the seeds does, get it out more nutrition from the flesh so you have a better quality of seeds. So like if you harvest like 10 watermelons, maybe leave one watermelon to save seeds from or store them for a little bit longer so you can have a higher quality of seeds. So that's kind of like covering all the flesh or wet processing seeds if anybody has any other question. There are a couple questions, you could repeat them. Um, after, uh, so the question is, will, will rinsing watermelon seeds work? Simply rinsing watermelon seeds work? It does, it does work, but it will be- Can better. you repeat the question, sorry. Okay, sorry. If, uh, if it matters, if it's important to rinse the watermelon seeds. Um, it is important to rinse it off because it has a little layer that you kind of want to get rid of it. Because like, the seeds are just protecting themselves. The plants create these things to protect themselves to go deal with nature. But when we are want to harvest, we want to put the watermelon and to germinate in like right away, more or less. <laughs> in five minutes, we're looking like, where are the seeds? <laughs> so what we do is like we help by doing the fermentation or rinsing, get it out a little white layer on the watermelon seeds. It's going to kind of like give it more space, like kind of like put it naked to the seed and Hurry up, the water can go in and germinate and faster. 
Other question? Uh, of just a clarification that you need to dry the seeds. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. That's very important. Like dry, like it's the same, like on a paper towel. Just put it. Why you put it on paper towel? It's because like it's going to suck the moisture faster. And then if you put it in a space where the like maybe have a little fan or it's just like the air is flowing, it's the best place to to dry them. Okay, so we're kind of done with the wet processing. That's tomato, peppers, and we can go now with what we have the herbs. We we'll talk a little bit about with herbs like all the herbs like cilantro, dill. We have here um um. Um, the flowers, the same thing. This is um, <laughs> that's a good thing. This shows up inside, isn't it? Okay, we have here. I have a very high technology here. <laughs> you guys are gonna be very surprised. You see this too? <laughs> you can't find anywhere close. <laughs> No, this is basically just a sandals. But the nice thing about these sandals is you have a grip to hold on, and it has this little. Can I show this? Like this little kind of like cracks where the seeds can go there. But since it's rubber, it doesn't damage the seeds. So that's the nice thing with these. Um, this, yeah, I told you it was a high technology. <laughs> Can't find it close here. <laughs> this is actually sandals from Bolivia. A friend of mine uh, went to Bolivia. She's from Argentina and she thought of me when she bought it. And she sent it to me, but they're kind of big for me. So I had them stored like for quite some time. And it was one day I was trying to clean seeds. And I was, you know, like with basil, for example, you can see here, like I'm trying to find, you see? And then when you do it with by hand, if you are doing one cup over this amount, you'll be fine. But if you are doing like, I'm telling you like 200 plants of basil and by hand, it's not fun. So what like one day I said like, okay, we are going to get over deep. Actually, if you look, okay. if, you, if you do this, Real quick, it'll zoom out like this. Okay. Like an L. Mm -hmm. yep. Yep. Well, Technology. <laughs> right? Okay. So what I do is I put it, for example, and I'm gonna just smash it without feeling sorry about nobody. <laughs> <laughs> because the teeth are not gonna be damaged with this one. And you can do like with any seeds, like with um um flower seeds like you just make sure like you get it out because the thing is like with basil uh, like they flower and then they have these little capsules where they put the seeds on where they hide the seeds and you want to get them out so then you can use these nice screens and now i just brought one but usually this one comes like in packets of eight of them, different sizes. So that's really great. And then you kind of like separate the big chap and then you can get rid of them. I don't know where, here. Uh, I don't know, put it back there because I'll be keep processing that one. So then you have a very fine one. And then what you can do is also use some of this, like it's kind of like the same size. So what you do is you put it on here and you get rid of all the most fine powder ones. And then once you get rid of, now you have like um, seeds that are the same size as the chaff, but there's a difference on weight. The seeds are a little bit heavier than the chaff. So you can do blowing like I would do. But, if you are doing again big quantities, you use fan. I like to do it outside. Use the wind, especially like in a windy fall days. Uh, if you come around Shawnee, you will see me outside. <laughs> it makes smell the whole neighborhood beautiful uh, basil. So, so then you have like then you separate like these beautiful black seeds. That's basil. 
And now like if you're saving for your own, you don't necessarily have to go through all this trouble, right? But like if you are trying to keep it in, like if you want to try to keep it and put it like in a store, then that probably will help. But the main thing is you, you can just harvest, dry them out. Very good because if you don't dry them, especially basil, they kind of get moldy and then the seeds, how you know they got moldy is like the seeds are going to have this or sometimes before, like when the rain comes and gets them, you're going to have like the seeds that are uh, covered Oops. with little white mold. And sometimes that won't germinate that good or the germination is going to be slow. So that's kind of like a main thing with <clears throat> basil. And the same thing with dill is more easier than basil, like when the the, the seed uh, where the flower is brown, that's when it's ready to harvest. And now we can go with the flowers. <clears throat> we have here a beautiful flower. See, this is a Peruvian flower, Zinnia Peruviana. And you can harvest them for seeds, for example. You can cut them when they are yellow still. But the best one is to get, this one was already brown. You can see the brown there. That's the best quality of seeds you have. And then where are the seeds? The seeds are right there inside. You see there are tons of seeds here. I need to cover this guy. I apologize for the shaky camera work here. photographers <laughs> not working. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the seeds okay. are over here where Oh. It, it it takes quite some, I mean, again, oh we, on these ones that we just, like, if I'm doing a big quantity, what I'm going to do is just doing this, just, just smash it, the whole thing. And the same thing with this one. I would just dance on them. And then there is all the sharp. And then I have, and then I would winnow in with the wind. And then I'm going to have this, like, all these beautiful seeds. This one is, just, I, I love these seeds because they're kind of like a little, unlike the other zinnias, like the common zinnias that we have, mm -hmm. big flowers. Those ones are more like, more white. These ones are unique. And then you can just store them again in glasses. And sometimes, like, if you do, like, the cut flowers, you know, you bring in the cut flowers. And some, some of the zinnias, they will mature at that point still when you have it on your glass so you can still save seeds from them so we have these with zinnias anybody has any questions with the zinnias or herbs or any specific uh, i'm gonna find some old sandals because things like <laughs> cone flowers that are so sharp when you try to get the seeds from a cone flower that's genius it's <laughs> genius these things well like it can like actually like, I should give a credit to my grandma this <laughs> because this is what we we were in Bolivia and I was growing up when she would put me you know they are processing the quinoa and then I would have my little sandals smaller than this and and then she would just put me to work and dance on it yeah. and then that's when I was like we used to dance on it but what about if I put it on my hands I have better yeah. grip on it and it's just like uh well, I have poked myself so many times on things like cone flowers. It, it hurts. So that's, that's yeah, yeah. When you are doing like that, so now we kind of like go into the dry, like more grains. Like, what is this over? Beans. beans. <laughs> so these are basically the green beans. Uh, like we eat them when they are green, right? But for seeds, you want to them to be dry like this. So if you leave it like in your green bean vine, maybe 20 pots on, and then you harvest them when they are dry, usually like when they start rattling and then it's very like easy and you just peel it off. And that is, and then you let it dry a little bit longer just to make sure there is no, uh, humidity on the seeds and then they can mold if you do that if you leave it uh, this is uh yeah this is all different colors it's her favorite beans she likes to process them it's fresh beans it's bush beans now this is one of um 
How, how many of you know cowboys? Right. About um, <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I like it. Uh, how many of you know black eyed peas? Yes, basically cow peas, bla black eyed peas. Wow, that's beautiful. So pass them around, maybe. Oh yeah, sure. Now, what we have here, this one we call hog brain. They can get this long, uh, very long uh, pods. But the nice thing with the coffees, you can eat them also when they're green. Mm -hmm. And they are, they taste like a, if you, you can correct me if you, if uh, like a fresh peas. Mm -hmm. Like, um, Im imagine having like peas in the middle of the summertime in Kansas. So, and they are very easy to grow, right? Very easy. They grow like a plant. Mm -hmm. I got my seed from Chris. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It's seed oh, they bind. Uh, they bind. There are other varieties that are more important. Yep, yep, but yep. The biggest producers are the vine, uh, the ones that bind. The vine. So we, I, I, I believe like the cow peas or the black eyed peas, I think they're most underestimated. Yes. Uh, crops that is like we can grow and we can like and the nice thing with this one is it's called hog brain like uh, again like you can eat when they are green and then if you got tired of them you can store them and then you can save some seeds from them and then also you can make soup in the middle of the winter yes. it's, they're so delicious to make a soup or you can just boil them they cook faster than the black beans like you overnight put it with water and the next morning, like in one hour, it's ready. Unlike like the black beans, sometimes you have to boil a little bit longer. So uh, I, I am I, like, we, we grow probably 10 varieties of cowpeas. A lot of people use them for cover crop because it's a nitrogen fixer. So it kind of helps with your plants. Uh, what we use this, we just plant them and we eat a lot of them and these, this variety is called hog brain. I think it comes like from the Carolinas. I think they have a special dish over there. But so many people, I, I don't know really the recipe. I'm not going to give the recipe. But it comes, um, and it's again, like it's very simple to harvest the seeds. You just peel them or you can also like, again, with my powerful tool, <laughs> what I do is like this. Um, <laughs> This morning, actually, I was like, or, or if I have like a whole bucket, I would just put these ones and just put music and start dancing, and step, <laughs> step, 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 and then find the, put it outside, find the wind and just winnow it. And then you have your, and then the chaff, you can put it back on the garden. That's good for your soil. Perfect thing to do while walking is to Oh, that is true. Oh, that'd be great. <laughs> I got to think next time. Yeah. So it's important to let the pods dry on the plant. Or for seeds. You, they have to dry on the plant yes. for better. Yes, okay. yes, yes. And I think one thing with copies a lot of people don't like is if the rain comes, they will get kind of spotty. Some varieties. <laughs> some varieties don't do that. So I think right now we have probably five varieties that are like probably 200 feet long so when the rain is coming i put both of the kids <laughs> the rain is coming we gotta hurry up pick all the copies so they're picking up so when when most produce seed producers are printing their material for you know, like germination time and product time that's to the fresh product they're not how much longer do you extend that time how long does it take from from the time when a bean would be fresh mm -hmm. and usable to dried and for seed? How much how, are you extending that? Oh yeah, like uh, for example, this one should be ready around uh, November because we're gonna let it dry completely right now. Like uh, after we harvest, even though they're still they're dry, but there's still some humidity. That sometimes when then you do the germination test. And then on the germination test, like the federal law is like 75% in order to sell the seeds legally, or you get in trouble. 
So like, but we try to go to 80% or 90%. And then sometimes like, sometimes if you want to test, test your seeds, it's, it's a good thing. How you can know like if your seeds have not dried correctly is like, if there's still humidity, they haven't reached the perfect dryness, they're not going to germinate. For example, like this one is, I can feel there's still some humidity there. And if I, Oh my goodness. If I put it to germinate, they're not going to germinate. This is going to sit there. So that is why it's very important to dry. So like, that's a good question. I think like uh, this one, this batch is going to be ready around uh, November. As, as far as a garden calendar, then you're actually almost doubling the season time, the growing season. If you plan your garden in stages, for instance, taking out part of it and then putting in a fall garden, uh -huh. you need to, no. you're, you're reserving that garden space for the full season. You grow the product to ripe, and then you leave it for another length of time to dry and get the seeds. And so you're committing that garden space for a lot longer period of time, right? Uh, the question is, uh, uh, if you are committing your garden for a longer period, yeah. the answer is right. It does take. Uh, that's why like uh, the planning is very important in the when you are doing seed saving because yeah you yeah. can just like if you have a certain crops takes longer like for example yeah the cowpeas for example if you want to just eat them and some people really love like they're green so if you are just growing for green coffees, then uh, if, and if you had already planned to plant their lettuce in the fall time, yeah, you kind of have to commit to live it a little, a little bit longer. Yes. Uh, the blue goose that were passed around, uh, that was uh, 90 days from planting to uh, harvest. 90, 90 days. And I interplanted it with <clears throat> ornamental corn, <clears throat> uh, ancestral corn. Because I mentioned the uh, it wants to bind, mm -hmm. <laughs> use the uh, mm -hmm. stocks, you know, it's the whole traditional three sisters. Three sisters. Yeah. yeah, with cowpeas and corn, I really that's a good point. Like he was saying about putting the cowpeas and the corn together, it's it's also like because the cowpeas go they grow very fast, like you plant it, like in a month, they're gonna be covering the whole thing, and then that kind of keeps like puts the weed suppressed and then you and then also it's keeping some nitrogen to your corn. So it's a really perfect planting, both of them. And, and I like to take uh, things that I'm gonna let dry but in a bee, like I, I grow rattlesnake beans, which makes a great green bean, but it's a great dried bean, but I grow them vertical vertically so you know that's not taking the next time. Yeah. So space is the thing that a lot of people have to consider when you're committing it for a longer period of time. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Like the same thing with corn, like sweet corn could be ready in 60 days to eat. But if you want to for seeds, you got to let it pass that sweet stage to go at least another month sometimes. Okay. So yes, yes, that's a good point. Yeah, with seeds, yeah, saving seeds, uh, it takes a little bit, it takes longer. No. So for these blue goods, um, I've made the... Second harvest of the dry pods, and I expect a third harvest uh, um, before I kill them under uh, later this month. Yeah, that's a nice thing with copies. You a lot of those varieties you can harvest like two last last year. This one we harvest four times. So you almost treat it as a cover crop. Kind of, just, you oh, really what? Back in. What? Yeah. Okay. Any question in online? Uh, no, um, uh, the, the varieties, the questions about varieties, and we put that your website up with the varieties you mentioned. Oh, so. they can find all the varieties there. Then. <laughs> Anybody, any other question or any? Or anybody wants any copies? <laughs> <laughs> I'm asking if there are any questions online. Go ahead. Would you give your website more time, please? Oh. Or share it? The Buffalo Seed Company dot com. Should have brought big. And, <laughs> uh, there is some seeds seed packets there. Whoever came in, some zinnias and this is basically the Buffalo Seed Company dot com. So if you come and grab a packet, 
but she's gonna be giving away, right? Thank you. <laughs> okay, now I think I covered. If anybody has any more questions, yeah. Does cotton hardware carry your seeds? Yes. Yeah, they do that. Actually, they were our first retailer. Catherine. Yeah, she's really cool. She's, and actually, today I'm going to drop off some wildflowers. It's right now is the time for wildflowers, right? All right, everyone, look at the chat. There's the. Oh. Yeah. And I'm <laughs> <laughs> I'll take your word for it, Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't see any other questions online. Yes. Um, I have a question about corn. Uh -huh. uh, corn uh, some of the corn that I grow um, is affected by uh, mold. Um, can we wash the seed um, to uh, prevent? Because you mentioned that uh, you seed know, born. Might affect, uh, germination or even infecting the uh, plant that would uh, grow from contaminated seed. So anything you can do for um, corn seed? That's a good question. If anything you can do with uh, contaminated seeds with mold ones like through the humidity that we have sometimes after the rain, uh, you can rinse it if it's just a white mold. But now it's another kind of like fusarium, other molds that's like it's black and we just toss it away the seeds but if it's like this very innocent white mold that just do it to humidity you can rinse it off wash it and dry it fast as fast as possible can dry put it more or less on the sun and you should be good with that yep anybody had a question and i don't see any questions on all of that online, is so I great to anybody want to try some Tomatoes, since nobody had tomatoes. <laughs> I just want to thank you so much. This was very interesting. We had a lot of people online as well as here. Um, and the, all the information is online with the, the, the seed company online. You can get them at Cotton's. And, uh, and I just want to thank our speaker for coming and, and demonstrating we all now have a great new tool. Uh, <laughs> to use. That is my powerful tool. You see, yes. high technology. <laughs> yes, and I also like the phrase, the innocent white mold. I heard that, so I like that. <laughs> so thank you and thank you to your helper here. <laughs>